brother? What's Can going I hear on? You? What's going on? This is exciting. I'm so happy yeah. to speak with you tonight. Um, to answer the question or to just comment on what Holly just said, yeah, just turn on your notifications to let you know when I go live, and that should be helpful. Um, and you'll just get notifications when I go live. Hello, hello. Um, Can you hear right, me? So, so as we were talking about how we were going to approach this tonight, uh, Dr. Pugh, um, I said, hey, I think that I'll just get an article. Oh, look, I'm, I'm in two places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, um, I think that I'll just get an article mm -hmm. and like talk about a DEI topic or a DEI related topic and you thought hey I might be able to come in on that because you've seen some stuff out lately Man. that you wanted to make comment on sure. uh, and so yeah so here so here's the thing with diversity equity and inclusion um, mm -hmm. so just with the we see that a lot of organizations are venturing out and they're getting um, CDOs and they're coming up with um, diversity, equity, and inclusion plans. Some are coming up with diversity, equity, inclusion, and engagement plans. There's there's a mm. lot of talk around mm. that. Um, so before we get into it, though, you're here now. So let's, let's do an introduction. So why don't you tell us who you are? Um, sure. Yeah, let's start with that. Who, who are you, sir? Tell us who you are. Man, I'm just somebody just being thankful. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie to you. Uh, well, to everybody, first, first of all, I, you know, we went to undergrad together, and you, you've seen, you've seen a lot. <laughs> so that's, that's first. Uh, but now nah, I'm um, just, just a regular dude. My name is Marion Christopher Pugh from Atlanta, Georgia. Product of uh, the Cal County School System. Went to private and public yeah. schools. Um, came down to Georgia Southern roughly about 20 years ago. Um, came down, didn't even know I was going to Georgia Southern. Uh, ended up getting removed from Georgia Southern academic exclusion. Uh, mm. Went home. Yeah, went home. Um, worked uh, for like a couple of years. Found out that there was a plan for me not to go to school. So when I found out the overall aspect of me getting kicked out, I came back for a specific reasons other than just getting a college degree, I found out the game that was being played for a lot of, on a lot of people, I would say. So uh, yeah. <clears throat> I would say not only it was me, but I found out that it was a large group of young men in my cohort that was kicked out around the same time. And so Ooh. we would start, we start talking, yeah, we would start talking around and we start comparing backgrounds and circumstances that happened at, mm -hmm. you know, at our college. And it was eerily, it was eerily similar. <laughs> so I was like, hold up, hold on, you got denied too? And everybody's just looking around <laughs> like, hold on, there's something else going on here. So when I came back, I started understanding that it's not necessarily about smart and dumb, it's about strengths and weaknesses and access to different avenues to get through this thing we call college. You know what I mean? Um, right. When I, you know, most of us, when we first got to college, you no, know, some of us didn't know we were college material until we got there. And then you find out how many other people who were getting A's and B's, but they couldn't, they still count with their fingers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So I'm sitting up here, I'm serious, for real. So when I find out, yeah. I'm like, hold on, it's not about the most intelligent, it's who received the playbook before they had to play the game. And I found That's out right. that a lot of people in my cohort, we were extremely underexposed, but we were still yeah. intelligent. So when I found out we mm -hmm. were underexposed, I just try to make sure I did my part to make sure all people that who are underexposed get the right amount of exposure. I just try to approach people like plants. Plants are not done because they don't get sunlight. You know what I mean? So That's I try right. to make sure that, right. you know, try, try to make sure that mm -hmm. any and everybody who uh, wants to grow, they get adequate sunlight, enough water, enough space to grow and, mm -hmm. you know, fertile soil for the most part. So when I came back to school, went through undergrad and the stuff that I went through, I decided to go and get my degree, master's degree in school counseling. And the reason why I wanted to get school counseling is I, be, I found out that a lot of people determine their self-worth based off how they did in the school environment. And so you have a lot of people who drop out of school and they actually thought just like me, they were taught they were going to be dead or in jail. So a lot wow. of people equated not being in school with dying early. And so when I had to find out where did that come from, and then I found out that we had this, uh, I would say, 
uh, extremely allergic narrative. We're allergic to the narrative of certain of us, certain groups of us, depending on our description uh, in this in this country, that the statistic kind of determined our fate if we weren't careful. So a lot of people may not understand, man, if you get the same message over and over again, it doesn't matter where, whether it's true or not, it becomes real if it gets repeated enough. So uh, after I got my school counseling degree, I worked in diversity for about eight, nine years. I was doing a lot of volunteer service for um, local schools um, and just pretty much just mentoring people. And a lot of people may not understand this, the more I mentored, I even got mentored even more. I hope that makes sense. So as many people I was helping, I was getting more help as I was helping. So it wasn't like I was just pouring out. A lot of people were pouring into me too. So I started getting all type of um, uh, mentors. I mean, uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, Dr. Sabajalo, uh, uh, Dr. Right. Spencer. Yeah. Uh, you, you had, we had, I had so many different resources, Consuela Ward. We had so many heavy hitters on campus that you can go and just start bouncing these ideas off of. And they can give you, they can put you right back in the game and you can go out down the battlefield and keep that thing going. Um, after eight years of uh, student affairs, I was already enrolled in, um, in, uh, in the doctoral program curriculum studies at, at Georgia Southern. Uh, finished there and, and my curriculum studies was basically me trying to find out the politics and power structure behind what we think mm -hmm. is education. Mm -hmm. And I found out that there are so many different avenues of education that we don't understand. And if we don't understand how to give our kids the game, the game will play them, you know? And so that's, that's right. what I, that's why I decided to, you know, pretty much just give my life to that. Um, but I also do comedy, man. Comedy, uh, you met me when I was doing comedy in undergrad. So uh, comedy, a lot of people may not understand. It was my, it was my first love but it was also a way that I got through school. A lot of people don't understand is I, I, I did comedy to pay a lot of rent. I was doing comedy and yeah. I was doing security. <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was doing comedy and doing security at clubs. A lot of people may not understand that. I'm a big dude, but I don't fight nobody. So I just look mean at the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, so that's pretty much it. So now I do education consulting for different uh, school districts across the country. Uh, I'm a professional speaker as well. And um, and I do um, mentoring and consulting sessions for families and business owners and kids. So hopefully that one. That's what's up. So and so that's what you're talking about. Really quickly, um, it was about. So did you finish up your your doctoral program about a year ago, or is yeah. it just over a year? Maybe a year and a half ago. May I would time. love for you. I would May. love for you to share mm -hmm. the title of your dissertation. <laughs> And just give us just like a quick rundown because I thought it was so dope when you, uh, I guess we were like outside of a, an alumni event and you yeah. said what it was and I was like, that's so dope. So share that with us. Gotcha. So my dissertation topic was called Humanity in the Black, uh, Applying Counter-Racist Logic with Comedy and Hip Hop. So what, mm. what does that mean? So Humanity in the Black, Humanity in the Black basically means that we have to investigate all of the descriptions and labels that we put on different groups of humanity that end up being tools to take their humanity away. So I found out, right. I just started researching um, counter racist logic and I came upon Neely Fuller Jr. and Dr. Francis Crest Wilson. Whoop. And, and I'm telling you, and but before I got to them, I was studying Dr. Naeem Akbar, Amos Wilson, all of these black psychologists. And they were really giving so much game. And I'm like, man, I could have used this in middle school. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and that's what a lot of people may not have understood. When, when I got to the curriculum studies department, when you get your doctoral program, especially in, in my experience, that was the most ever. I mean, that was the most amount of authors that looked like me that were required. I would say that. Mm. Yeah, they look just like me. So I, I that's, study me. That's really big to talk about because you oh, can yeah. get, and, and I, you've mm -hmm. heard this before, and it's it's almost to where it's like a cliche in certain groups, mm -hmm. but just this whole concept of, you know, I can get a whole degree. Like I think about Warren, and he got a whole English lit degree and didn't have to take any American lit. He took it, or African American lit. He mm -hmm. took it, but he mm -hmm. could have very well got that degree without ever having to touch on or analyze the impact of mm. African-American authors to American literature. 
And so what you just said, I think is really big because it wasn't until you got to your doctoral program that these authors, these thinkers, these thought leaders were required. Right. And, and kind of right. like what that means and how you see the world um, and kind of like just, just your whole worldview, your philosophy. So I think that that was an important point you just made. Um, so yeah, so you just, you just dropped a couple of bars, but I'm not going to go there first. I'm not going to go there yet. Um, We're gonna tell go us there. about um, <laughs> tell us about manhood mindset. I, I follow you on IG, so I see you helping yeah. out the little brothers, telling them yeah. kicking game to the kids. Uh, to. Tell us a little bit about manhood my, uh, mindset uh, specifically. Man, manhood mindset basically is a consulting approach to having real conversations with everyone, especially children. So what I what I started out with was trying to help kids and I found out that you can help kids all day, but they're still subjected to the adults that run their world. You know what I mean? Um, and also too, what I found out is that <clears throat> the education system, if we don't understand the history behind our education system and the reality of it, we have to, we do have to come to grips that our education system is, does not have a balanced masculine and feminine energy approached in it. Uh, we have, um, I would put like this, a lot of people are great teachers, but it's, it's nothing as powerful as seeing someone who has your matching energy teaching you. And there's no knock on anyone. It's almost like, it's almost like this. We do have to have a conversation about why are the only men in our schools coaching or cleaning, cleaning up? That's an issue. You know what I mean? So. That's if I right. wanted to really address some of the issues, because some of the issues is not intellect, it's energy, it's overall respect, uh -huh. it's the lived experience. So what I found out uh -huh. is that a lot of the young boys in our school system are not treated like human beings. Like where a lot of people end up, you know, say for instance, if you're having a bad day, um, a lot of young boys, if they're not having a great day, depending on what their stature is and what their description is, they're still seen as a threat when they're sad and depressed. And so when That's you approach right. them as a threat and they're having a bad day, like as a human being, conflict is guaranteed. So what I found out is that not only when, when people hear the word manhood mindset, sometimes people think I'm only helping out young men when actually I'm trying to balance out the environment that literally chews them up and spits them out. So sometimes you have a lot of young ladies who don't understand how to in like, um, I would say engage another man, period. They have no idea. And you got people, and I'm gonna be honest with you, we have a lot of professionals who don't know how to talk with each other at all. Right. We have a lot of professional talkers, but we don't have enough professional teachers. We got a lot of people who are very smart, but they don't know how to necessarily communicate. And I'm not digging at them. It's because our society is not necessarily that big on communication. It's about prestige and titles and what mm -hmm. you look like to everyone. And then when you don't know how to communicate, the only thing you have to do is get abusive and then everybody follows orders. And you think you're communicating right. when the only thing you're doing is scaring the hell out of people. And they're just following your lead, right. you know what I mean? So manhood mindset, it means a lot to a lot of different people. With me, it doesn't have a definition because that's, I mean, it was, it started out with me trying to figure out who I was, regardless of what society was trying to tell me who I was. And being honest with you, it was a journey of me trying to get really close and understand who my father was. My father passed away in 2013. So, um, and my dad wasn't that talkative, but now I'm understanding him more as I became a man. You know what I mean? Because sometimes when you're a kid, you don't understand what your father is doing until you're in his shoes or in his space. So now I'm finding out that it's a huge possibility. My father didn't talk a lot because a lot of people weren't listening. Wow. And so, yeah. So, wow. so now manhood mindset is a journey. It, it includes a journey with me getting to know my father by living in his shoes as an adult targeted man, you know, am I that talkative if I had to fight for my life all day? Do I have the energy to come home and entertain when I had to go out for 10 plus hours and provide all day? Do I have enough energy to give you the attention that you need when I really have to fight for my life? 
you know, so right. I'm just trying to, you know, and, and just at the end of the day, manhood mindset is basically a journey. It's a spiritual thing is it has a lot to do with manhood and humanity, really. So what does being a human really mean? How do we think like a human being other than thinking that we're part of a group that we didn't even have any power over naming ourselves? That's the Listen. issue. Listen. And so, yeah, so that is a good segue for me to jump back a couple of minutes because you talked about these labels that have been created. Yeah. And we know that in the United States of America, we've had two, uh, two, so, two sociopolitical labels that have been created. Mm -hmm. One advantaged you legally and one disadvantaged you legally and therefore mm -hmm. socially, educationally, et cetera. Exactly. And so as you think about the labels of black and white, can you kind of mm -hmm. share um, just what you've seen through your work with um, black boys specifically and kind of mm -hmm. just the top things that, that they were dealing with, like the, the communities of boys that you were dealing with? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When I found out that black is not a skin tone, it's a circumstance based off of a targeting system. So uh -huh. it, it's, it's one of those things where um, I'm going to tell you exactly the day I, it kind of sparked me. Like I've always wondered, but it's, all of us have that one day that took all the excuses away. It was like, all right, right. now you know. If you act like you don't know after the day, you're going to have to suffer some consequences, right? So right. I, was teaching, I was teaching Malcolm X as an FYE class and had a young man that was from Jamaica. And his skin tone was lighter than mine, but he was straight Jamaican. Right. So right. Uh, a young lady, we were talking about Malcolm X. And anytime we're talking about Malcolm X, you have to teach not only Malcolm X's words, but you do have to talk about how the world tried to paint Malcolm X without his permission. Right. So right. now we, we were talking. I mean, we were getting it in and all of my my whole class was extremely diverse, different ethnicities, different countries. Really, it was international students in there and they knew some things that the students who were born in the States did not know. So we had a heated discussion one day and a young lady, she self-identified as being black and she looked at him and he was like, I really don't know what this black stuff means. Y'all can have it. And she was like, you don't know who you are. And he was like, on the contrary, I'm Jamaican. I didn't hear nothing about this black stuff until I got over here. And then my brain literally just We're racialized. We are racialized people. Um, we have been we're, racialized. And and it's so funny right. that you said that. There are so many people um, who are in like the kind of like the entertainment journalism space who have said what you just said. Maybe they're from continental Africa. So they're from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just mm -hmm. from somewhere. They're, they're from the continent or they're from uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Caribbean. It's not until they get right. over here that they have this concept of blackness because mm -hmm. that is not they're in a majority black country, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's just not how people are interacting with each other there. That's not mm -hmm. to say that there aren't um, some things that they have to deal with, I'll mm -hmm. say. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like I've seen that too, which, and, and granted, I remember being at uh, being in school and I was working on a research project. I'll never forget this. It, mm -hmm. it was in undergrad. And I was working with a woman, and I forget where she was from. She would just always say she was from the island. She, I don't remember which island she was from. And I'll never forget, we were doing a study on the perceptions of attractiveness in the African-American community. That was our project. And so we were going around and doing surveys out on campus. And so one of the things that the professor had us think about is what is something that may impact your respondents and, and like how they respond to the survey? And mm -hmm. I said, I will never forget this. This was like 20 years ago. I will never forget this. Um, right. I said, well, I think because we're both black women, they may be more hesitant to answer some of the questions truthfully about what they find attractive and what and, and what they don't find attractive. And mm -hmm. this woman, who was maybe a shade lighter than me, looked at me in that professor's office and said, I'm not black. And I was like, mm -hmm. miss. I was yeah. like, I mean, but you are though. And she was just yeah. like, no, I'm from the, and I forget what island she was from. But again, yeah. it's going back to you. Like I've had that happen to me personally. Yeah. Also in undergrad, I had a guy, he was from Honduras, big yep. Afro. Yep. And I forget his name, but we were walking 
And I messed around and called him black too. He was like three shades darker than me. Yep. I messed around and called him black. He oh no, like, no, 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 no. Yeah. And so, but it, but it's so different now because we have this kind of flattening of blackness that happens and everyone's like, everyone's like I'm black. I'm. Right. But that was not always the case. So that mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry to get us off into a rabbit trail there, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that is. No, you're saying something. Experience. You're saying it's something that's extremely important because this these are not occurrences that our people are just um, just oblivious to. A lot of us are very uncomfortable when it happens, so we just act like it didn't happen. Because most of us who've been told, no, for real, most of us who we've been told we were black by people we love and people we don't like at all, it stuck uh -huh. because it was the same repetition. It's almost like that song you don't like, but you hear it so much that you know the lyrics to. That's exactly Yeah, what, that's how yeah. I was with that one. Uh, what's that child's name? M-I-A, whatever her name is. Me, whatever. <laughs> Ella May. Yeah. 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 I did not like that song, but Lord knows I couldn't get away from it. Yeah, right. so I'm feeling you on that too, but yeah, and think, you just think you And think about this. It. Everybody remembers, everybody may not remember exactly what was told the first time they had that race conversation, but everybody remembers being confused. Everybody. Because as soon as, put like this, if your mom or dad has to explain to you what you look like, that's already a confusing question. I mean, that's right. a confusing conversation. So what yeah. they're trying to tell us without, and some of them don't even have the words. They're just passing down a safety talk in the words that it was given to them. Hey, mm -hmm. you're black. And most of the kids are like, the hell are you talking about? And then after a while, after a while, mamas and daddies be like, look, we ain't got time to explain. Just know people looking for you. <laughs> like when you get pulled over, it's certain right. things. You're gonna, it, it becomes a safety talk. And I found out that that talk is not a talk. It's literally a debriefing right before you go to warfare. Mm. That's what it is. Because it's the debriefing. It's almost like when you're a child, and, and, and put like this, I see it with so many different families, even families who are identified as being white, they wait for a while until they have that talk, until they have to have the talk because some conflict popped off. And then the conflict popped off, the child is confused, and then you get the debriefing. So it's almost like a retroactive war assignment. Oh, my bad. I forgot you were being targeted. Huh? Yeah. Right. If you, your skin right. tone is, you know, it can make people mad. What? Just come home before right. dark. Like, like, that's what it really boils. <laughs> that's what it really boils. It, it boils down to that, right? So I, I put like this, what you're saying, that conversation that we had with our students, and I'm going to tell you this, the student who identified as being Jamaican, he said, I don't know what y'all dealing with over here, but I'm human where I'm from. And that's what did it. I was like, whoa, what's going on? Then I started doing the research with it. And being honest with you, black literally means non-human. That's literally what it means. It's uncomfortable to talk about. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's just, it's one of those things where after a while you start asking real questions and then it's hard to ignore it after a while because I'm a bit like this. Um, when I even want my class and most of my class are a uh, vast majority middle class women who self-identify as white, right? And I asked right. them, I said, how can we be different skin tones and the same color? And then everybody gets real quiet. And I said, just let that quietness teach you something. Because if you're confused, and I have this saying, I say, anytime that you're confused, you're being taken advantage of. There's no such thing as confusion and peace. There's no, there's no, there, there is, they can't coexist. If you're confused, that means you don't know what to do. Anxiety is going up. And if you're anxious and you still don't know what to do, you end up taking it out on somebody who you think is has an advantage over you. And that's what the racial divide is. You got two confused sides who are believing something they can't prove and they know it's not real. However, that's all we know. So the only thing we're doing is reciting a song that we can't stand louder than the other person. That's it. Well, and so you're so you're really saying something, and, and I and I hear you, and I feel you on this. What do you do with the fact that there are real life implications for these yep. imagined identities or these identities that have been put upon people? Like, what do you do with that? Because it's like, okay, I can say I'm not black. I can say that, and mm -hmm. I can say that mm -hmm. if society mm -hmm. treats me like I'm black. <laughs> so, right. so what is it? How do you right. help people kind of think through that? Um, and, 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 and on the other side, and on the other side of that white, how did, how, what do you do with that? How do you help people think well, through that? I'll put like this. 
in my classroom, I always tell my students, we can only control what's going on in this room. As soon as you leave this classroom, you're going to have to deal with the matrix all over again. So I will tell you this. Um, and even I know we had our situations at Georgia Southern and a lot of people from all over the planet have when they have diversity talks, it gets very, very edgy. Right. And a lot of people on the edge of the seats are very anxious. Right. What a lot of people don't understand, the reason why it is very hard to talk about race, you can't talk about race unless you start talking about identity crisis. Mm. When people experience an identity crisis, usually there's a breakdown. <laughs> so that's the reason why it's hard talking about race because people are really about to address something they knew what was false their entire life and a lot in mm, this world okay. this world and i'm gonna be honest with you this world is is a big flex we get out we literally we feed our families by being something that we're not so anytime when we try to attack attack that identity that's been feeding our families for generations we get nervous rightfully so because now, I'm going to be honest with you, some people have their jobs because they self-identify with something they don't understand. <laughs> they have their jobs. So if they're looking for a black man and yeah. he knows he ain't black, but, hey, I fit the description. And when you fit the description, you get to eat. Trust me, when somebody start questioning that description, they naturally have to bite your hand because you're ruining him having a chance to feed his family. So what do I do in this case? I get people who want to have an honest conversation about it, I give them that honest conversation. Because being honest with you, a lot of people are not mentally stable enough to have a conversation about race. That's what I'm finding out. The mental capacity to like really... Nice well. I'm telling you, because right now it's deeper than it being a common sense type thing. It's literally one of those things where how do you feel about telling the truth? You literally have to get to the elementary phase when you're talking to people like, hey, do you have a need to lie? <laughs> like, and then they were looking like, like seriously. And so what I, what I do yeah. now, anytime when I talk about race, and when I go to different schools, like I'm with the Georgia Southwestern um, uh, about a couple of months ago, and I'm supposed to go back soon. Um, the first thing I do is ask them, do you self-identify with a race? The first question. And they already get nervous. And they, I don't even answer the question. I said, can we at least talk about the nervousness? I said, y'all are nervous yeah. when I ask you that question. And a lot of them don't even understand what it is. They just know they've been told. So now they're being accountable. And so I tell all the students that I teach in my class, I'm not here to change your mind. I'm here to make you responsible for the mind you have. That is it. Yeah. I don't I don't want to change you. If you if that's what your parents taught you to be, enjoy it. But from this day forward, You'll never be able to say, that's what I was told. You would say, this is what I decided. Because we have that's too many right. people. Yeah. We got too many adults yeah. blaming older adults for what an adult told them. I say, after you're an adult, you're required to, like, you're responsible for telling the truth now. Yeah, you couldn't help who's, what, what lies you were told all the way up until 18. But as soon as you hit 18 and 19 and 20, you got sent off and you can educate yourself. Because mommy and daddy, they're going to say enough to you for you to come back home safely and for them to feel good as parents. Parents lie. Right. Just being honest with you. Parents lie to their children. Some of them do it for different reasons. Some people do it because they want to be a hero in their children's eyes. And some parents right. lie to their children so their child can come home alive. So I can't tell right. I can't tell a parent what to do. We all lie for different reasons. However, when we're adults and we're on our own, the number one thing I would ask people is to stop lying to yourself. If you stop yeah. lying to yourself, it'll be easier to not lie to other people. So after That's a while, right. when I find out that, hey, man, something is going on with these labels and stuff like that, and then when I went on to the United States Census and you start looking up these labels definitions, we are playing a dangerous game that nobody wants to talk mm. about. That's what we're dealing with. Mm. That's what we're dealing with. Because I'm going to be honest with you. If our constitution still has slavery as being legal, people are still upholding the constitution. So what there's right. a lot of people don't understand is if slavery is in the constitution and people get to swear to uphold it, we should not be surprised. But the reason why a lot of people are surprised is because nobody has read the constitution in some of these terms that include or exclude certain people and dehumanize certain That's groups, right. period. So. That's right. I'm going to be honest with you. I was yeah. reading, I, I read the Constitution the other day, and I was like, if we want productive citizens, 
I would have the a constitution class mandatory at every grade. As soon as they can read I it. Think, I don't think that anyone made me think about the constitution beyond like the fifth grade. Oh man. <laughs> the I, US Constitution, I don't think I had to, you know, you have to memorize the preamble and all this yeah, kind of stuff here, but yeah. I, don't, I don't think uh I had to really even think yeah. about it. Because think about this. Yeah. A lot of people pledge allegiance to the flag, and it was just like, there's no God in schools. I said, do you pledge allegiance to the flag every day? They were like, yeah. I said, well, say it out loud. One nation under God. And they were like, <gasps> I'm like, I didn't lie to you. <laughs> I said, I didn't add it. <laughs> like, I said, you, right. they took that out. Of, right. I said, put like this. A lot of people don't understand. When you say the word God, everybody ain't talking about the same thing. So that's that's the biggest issue. We love to assume because if ignorance is bliss, the truth is traumatic. That's what I tell everybody. Mm -hmm. That's why I tell everybody. Talking about the truth, I would I would say people, you don't have to be scared about it, but I would you have to treat this society damn near like an insane asylum. You have to really tread. You you can you be yourself, but you can't you can't expect other people to be cool with an identity crisis on demand. Like this stuff right. is just ridiculous. You see what I'm saying? And you got people yeah, who are no, really you told me that before. I, yeah, you yeah. told me that that you said that same thing to me. You're like, you know, just this is an insane aside. Don't be surprised when people are throwing poop on the walls. <laughs> yep. And yep. I'm just like, yeah, that that and in the day I actually remember, um, yep. I believe you and Wifey were walking around the track. Yep. And I yep. was like, yo, this yep. what is this happening? Is it. Like it was it was the craziest stuff, and I was like, man. Yes. Christians dropped the jewel. Like I just, I needed to hear that because I was like, I know I'm not crazy. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm looking no, at and, and I'm like, I am saying, I'm saying that the sky is blue and the grass is green, and everybody's right. telling me that that is not the case. And I'm trying to figure out right. how that can be so. And right. You said that to me, and I was like, damn, he's right. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm expecting it, too much. <laughs> no, no, no. It's and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be honest with you. And when we were working in politics, like some things we think we're working in education, education is bringing the best out of people. It's never about stomping someone's light out. You know what I'm saying? Anytime, right. any, anytime, yeah. anytime when someone is rejected from growing, education is out the window. So when I was, in, you know, when we were actually in different environments, I had to stop saying I'm in a place of higher mm -hmm. learning. I'm in a place of higher politics. Because I had to stop lying to myself because I'm going to be honest with you. The more and more I kept saying I was at a school or at a university or a place of, you know, education, this, that, and other, I was literally putting myself in an asylum. I was right. literally doing it to myself because at first you were like, hold on, how can they do X, Y, and Z? And then I realized, I said, you know what? You're ignoring what you're looking at, dude. That's stop right. ignoring what you're looking at. Certain people are targeted. What you saw just happened. Stop giving people pep talks because you're going to make yeah, them insane. Yeah. Because now, like, honestly, when I did my mentoring program, it was so much horrific stuff happening to the point where I, wow. it, got, it got to the point I was like, come here. And they were like, why is this happening? I said, I don't know yet, but it's wrong. I'm not finna say it'll be all right. I don't know right. if it'll be all right. I said, but and just you, probably, you feel that it's wrong? Right. Yeah, you're right yeah, that it's wrong. Don't let anybody yeah. tell you that it's right. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. that's what I had to because at first I'm really I really am good at making people feel good. But I think what I had to sacrifice was that that feel good talk that I was really good at, and I'm still good at it, but I hold it until the most appropriate time. When someone is getting abused and assaulted and targeted, it's extremely important when somebody got shot at, you tell a person they're shooting. Like you don't, yes. you know, if somebody's getting shot at, you don't, you don't, you don't no, tell them, hey man, run. keep don't go back. Like you, no, you. If somebody be like, hey, are they shooting? And be like, no, keep God first, everything will be all right. <laughs> like no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, you don't, you don't keep doing that to people. You gonna cause that person you, to continue to get shot, bro? You gonna cause you them to die? What I'm and so when I was, what right. I found out is my pep talks were putting them in a alternative reality, and I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything malicious. But I was doing some things counterproductive for their human their human development. Their human development literally demands truth and facts, not a whole bunch of pep talking hope. Now, 
Right. I would put like this. People could give themselves hope if they know the truth. I don't have to just keep giving them a nice little pet rally because I'm going to be honest with you. We've had too, so many pet rallies, we don't even know what damn team we are. Come on now. <laughs> I'm so serious. It's so right now, we may not we may not need the feel good because I think right now and that's that diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. The which you when you said when you told me that I was like that got to be talked about because mm -hmm. I'm I'm gonna be honest with you. When we think of diversity, and I say we as everyone because I think all of us, me included, are extremely underexposed to what diversity really means. And I've been in it for okay. 15 years. Okay. But I'm under, I'm really right. under schools, and guess what I'm finding out? I'm finding out that diversity is not based off the brochure; it's based off the board and the budget. I'm gonna say it one more time. Flesh that out because some people might not. I I yeah. feel like I know what you're talking about. Yes. But you because and that's just because of the space that I'm in. But why don't yes. you flesh that out for us? Okay. So sometimes I remember when I was working um, when I was doing mentoring program for underrepresented students, right? And so sometimes a lot of people were like, well, we need a picture of that person, this person here. And I was like, we need a picture. <laughs> it doesn't matter. And, but yeah, you need it. It needs to look a certain way. And I was like, uh, really? <laughs> like, I was like, okay. Yeah, it has to be diverse. And I was like, well, the budget is still low. The diversity <laughs> like, picture. Yeah. And so what happens is a lot of people don't understand Diversity has a lot to do with marketing, not equity. Come on now. All right. So now, say this, and say this out. And that's the reason why well, a lot of us are going to have to be very specific about what we're asking for, because a lot of us are still asking to feel better about our circumstance instead of it being better overall. And, I'm, and I'm going to be honest with you. I was a part, I, I did that for a while because I was like, hey, we need more representation. And I found out representation doesn't mean that your people eat. Come on now. It doesn't mean that you eat. You can have a representative and you can still be compromised. So mm -hmm. I feel like this, and, and I tell people all the time, I said, and, and, I, and I had this conversation, I've had town hall meetings at the town hall meetings, and they got, and now my first couple of town hall meetings, I'm like, yeah. And then like the 10th one, I was like, all right, let's write, hey, yo, <laughs> let's chill. Hey, what you asking for? And they were like, we need more black teachers. And I was like, cool. What does that do? Right. Like, no, seriously. I'm not, a, I'm not against it. I'm not, right. I'm not against it. And at the end of the day, and I'm going to be honest with you, <clears throat> a lot of people love to ask the the population who are actually in the school because the population in the school actually has the power to demand. The real thing that actually takes place is the alumni who knows the long-term either benefits or detriments. <laughs> the alumni have the knowledge to give the current student body the questions that need to be asked and the demands that need That's to be stated. Right. However, That's when right. you when you're in the fire, you don't know where the flames coming from. Everything's hot. Sometimes you mm -hmm. need to be on another. I'm serious. You don't know what it is. You just like it's hot in here. We just need ice. <laughs> it, we just need ice, and we are we looking at the flame. We're like you gonna need more than ice. No, I want to feel That's good. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and when it, and when it comes down to diversity, I try to tell people as much as possible. Find the budget. If you find the budget, you will find the priorities of any organization, any institution, and you, you won't have to talk to you blue in the face. You won't have to do anything. Just ask one question. I need to see your budget. Well, what can we do to make you feel more included? Send me the budget. Like, just keep saying budget over and over and over again because the budget tells the narrative. Because, see, put like this, like, right. I, like I said before, there's a difference between political correctness and correctness. Political correctness is marketing. Correctness is really flipping over the privilege. Nobody wants correctness. Okay. Political correctness will get everybody paid. It'll keep people working. It'll make everything look Listen, pretty good. Listen, I think somebody I'm, in the chat, I think we might have sent text messages back and forth today about that very topic. Because I, yes. I'll tell you this, Chris, 
I'm very skeptical. So let me go ahead and, and show my hand. And so because you're in the space and you've worked in the space, please, mm -hmm. you, you, you have the know-how, you have the knowledge, you've been able to mm -hmm. see, you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you just said something that I feel, mm -hmm. and I might be wrong because it's just a feeling. I'm not in it. Mm -hmm. But it looks like to me that a lot of the work that's being done in the DEI space is more of mm -hmm. like a political correctness, kind of a marketing. I, it is. Maybe that's not true. Tell me about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like, what are some of the, what are the outcomes from a, let's, let's start, let's, let's do the, let's do the bad and the ugly and on a positive note, the good. So what's going I on in like, the space? I, I put like this. I don't want people to mistake intent with control and power. You, you see what I'm saying? Okay. The people who are in control of the intent have none of the power. They got. They only have permission. That's the issue. Mm. If you got okay. permission, if you got permission, you don't have power. Permission is the transfer of power. That's what a lot of people don't get. So All if right. you still have to ask, is it okay to include your folks? It's not inclusion. That's a hard yeah. conversation to have, isn't it? So now one of the things, trust me on this, I do, I, I worked in diversity and I teach it, so I'm not against it. I don't think it's just, I don't think it's just a waste of time. However, right. I had to stop, I had to stop lying. <laughs> like, and I didn't even know I was lying. It was put like this, lying is a harsh word. I stopped telling something after I found out that it was not that. All right. Right. When you okay. know something is not reality, stop repeating it like it is. But I don't go out of my way to try to destroy other people from saying it. I just give them the truth and I get my space and let them find it out. Then they'll call me and be like, bruh, this what you were talking about? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's what I was talking about. So I put like this, when it, when it come down to that DEI space, this is what I would ask people to do. You don't have to give up hope, but don't indulge in, um, what's the word, Del delusional thinking. Don't like um I, I would say what's the, what's the what's the word that I'm looking for denial, all right? Denial okay. is a very denial is a very dangerous thing. When you look at something and you got so much blind hope that you don't even see that your curtains are on fire, <laughs> like mm -hmm. you you're looking at it and you're like, no, it's just a little warmer here. No, if you don't put that out, <laughs> no, if you don't put that out, your whole house is gonna go up in flames, dude. You can do all right. the pep talks if you want to, but people are dying and people are feeling like killing themselves. And I'm being honest mm -hmm. with you. I, I mean, in my line of work, it was so many self harm and suicidal thoughts just based off the experience of being unhuman. They didn't even know what wow. it was. We they wow. it's something that you can feel, but if we don't put the right words on it, it still adds confusion to the people we love. And that's what I had to stop doing. As soon as I found out what it was, and I was like, Do you even know what it means? No. I said, All right, do me a favor. I can't tell you what to say about yourself, but I'm gonna ask you, hold off on saying something about yourself if you don't know what it is. I said, Do you promise me that you'll research it before you start labeling yourself like that? Will you do that? They were like, yeah, I'll do that. Then they come back like, bruh. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's all right. Go find some friends, get a small circle, get you a, get you a six pack or something, and y'all work it out. But when it comes down to diversity on a higher level, I always ask people, yes, there's always going to be a line with diversity because now there's a budget for it. Federal. It's a federal budget for it. So now you're dealing with people's bottom dollar and their ability to feed their family. And now I'm gonna be honest with you. There's people who invite me to talk about it, and they 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 know they need it because the students are breaking down mentally. But mm. they know if they can't go around saying it because they gotta feed their families. So I tell them, I said, look, don't repeat mm -hmm. what I'm saying around campus. Invite me to do it because I can go home. And I even right. when I was even when I was in student affairs, I was bringing people in. They could say stuff right. I couldn't say because I had to work here. And I put That's like right. this. If you if you work at a place where you can't tell the truth, you have no diversity. That's right. Period. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We can have all the meetings in the world, yes, invite man. all these people. Yes, yes. It'll be a kumbaya. We can high five and you have your outings and the Christmas parties and, and everybody would be still scared and anxious. 
We just going with the yeah. flow, and if everybody you can't bring knows. yourself to this table. That's yeah. right. If you, if yeah. you can't come authentically, straight up, then you're absolutely right. And straight and I know, and and you, yeah, you're absolutely right. Just period. Yeah. If you, if and, you and, and I put like this, like I like I say, I don't want anybody who's doing the good work because you are saving lives. I'm not telling anybody mm -hmm. to stop doing the work. Hell, I'm still doing the work. So how in the hell I'm gonna tell right. somebody to not do it, right? I would say do it in the most authentic way without lying to the people you're helping. Try your best mm -hmm. to do it without lying, if at all possibility. Now, some of us are in a, such a weird corner that we have to lie in order to live. Now, if, they're, if people are compromised, I can't tell them to do anything because I'm not living in their shoes, right? But I will tell them this. If your job requires the sacrifice of your sanity you don't have one that's right you don't have one so i put like you know i tell them diversity equity inclusion it's basically warfare <laughs> and i know that's doom and gloom but what people think i put like this one group thinks inclusion the other group thinks invasion right Right. So we we got and the same words. That is that is one hundred percent true. I I don't. Yeah, that's one hundred percent true. Yeah, and think right. about this: one group thinks diversity, one groups, and one group thinks domination. Mm -hmm. One third of one group uh, thinks equity, other one thinks elimination. So when one person has hope, another person sees a threat. And that's the world that had, we've been living in for decades. And until we understand the words that we're using to describe each other, those are warfare words. It's almost like being drafted to a team and you don't even know what sport you're playing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, when, and honestly, when I talk to my kids who self-identify as being white, they don't know what it is. They have no idea. They just know they have to identify with that, not to piss Papa off. And I'm not trying to be funny. Mm -hmm. Right. They, they, they right. look. I'm. I don't put like this. They'll say, "Well, I've never been." Uh, well, we talk. We don't talk about race. But I said, "Can you bring somebody home that look like me?" Oh heavens, no. <laughs> 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 so heavens, you know, no. So y'all do. You know. Right, and somebody's see, this is the thing. Something, whether it's with words or with action, somebody's telling you. Someone's communicating something to you. And think um, about this, and I tell them this. I said, body language is, an, is a legit language. So I said, you know what's funny? If you've never seen a brown body anywhere you're from, that's a message. Period. Body language is that's a right. message. If you've never seen anyone that doesn't look like you at a certain spot, you need to ask yourself, how did it get like that? That's this right. Is it's a story. And that's yeah, when yeah. you can start learning the truth about where you live and the country yeah. you live in. You said something earlier, mm -hmm. and and I found it to be true, too. There, There is this mythology that so many people who live in the United States want to believe about the United States. Um, and it doesn't matter. Right. It typically doesn't matter what side of the, the political aisle you're on um, for the two major political mm -hmm. parties. That we want to believe that... Uh, that we have held on or upheld the ideals of our constitution, the parts that don't, but, and you know what, I, to your point, people aren't really reading what's in there anyway, because as you mentioned, slavery is still legal in the, in the constitution. Um, or even to look at like any type of historic events, complete, is that, the, what is that, the Declaration of Independence? What is that? <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's, I'm, I gotta read it. But you, <laughs> Look, no, and so to your point, I was, I was, I said to a friend one time, um, I think that I'm just going to, and it was, it was probably, there's a lot of hoopla around Confederate statues coming down, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, that's when you hear and you read about a lot of lost cause mythology and about like why the Civil War happened and stuff like that. And I was like, mm -hmm. guys, or I can just look at the documents for those who succeed, succeeded from the United States and just read their constitutions and you will see very much that slavery, these are there where I don't have to uh, make anything up, but I will get the official documents uh, and we can just put this to bed. Why do you continue to believe this mythology 
about what is the truth is in your face and and there's a well documented history about why all these statues were put up the 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 flag um think about like the the stars and bars being included on the georgia state flag when it was there we know mm -hmm. that that wasn't always like that we know when you put it up wasn't it in like the 50s when people was trying to like desegregate school like this is all public record beloved yes. what are you talking about right and so i i think you really hit it when you said that there's just like these these lies that we believe about ourselves and if we're confronted with them it's right. really uncomfortable right. um mm -hmm. and so and so i'm so glad that you were willing to talk about this because i know you're in the dei space and i know that you you get to work with a lot of folks tell me tell me some good stories like i know that you work with people who are future educators who will yeah. really hold the keys to the cities for some of these children they can make or break whether these kids are able to advance whether very early planting seeds in the in the minds mm -hmm. of these children tell us some good outcomes that you've right. seen uh from future educators and then maybe from yeah. some of the the other students that you've been able to work with i put like this <clears throat> one of the most um i would say best feelings i've ever had in my life to see a student realize who they were for the first time in my class now they've been mm. they've been they've been obeying people their entire life without thinking about what they were doing and in, in my classroom i'm not gonna lie to you you know i took i took tests and quizzes outside of my class for a reason because i was going to give them so much conflicting information based off the lies they were told in school that if i test you i would just be setting you up anyway it's too much because i said listen I, I always have this i said 16 weeks can't reverse 18 years but i will tell you that's this right 16 weeks will make you question 18 years and that's all i need you to do yeah. So when they come yeah. in, they I, I give them questions and I force them to talk in my classroom. They have to talk. If you don't talk, you lose 50% of your grade. And oh. and I tell them, and you know, I say, how many of y'all are uh, are not really good public speakers? And a lot of them raise their hands and they're like, oh, congratulations, but you chose to be teachers. So we're going to get over that real quick. <laughs> you're gonna you know have to figure that piece so, out really quickly that's you're right. gonna have to figure it out but but i will i will tell you this <clears throat> i've been fortunate uh to have some of the most honest and i'm telling you i've had a diverse not necessarily by skin tone but by thought processes and lived experiences i'm talking about people with different learning impairments i'm talking about socioeconomic status and we're talking about ethnicity too. And you got some people, I'll put like this, my very first uh, assignment every year is let me know your ethnicity. Half of my class every year have never heard of the word. Mm. So I said, okay. And they were like, well, what is ethnicity? I Googled it, this, I said, all right, what country are your ancestors from? Mm -hmm. And now they're like, <laughs> and they give it they're in space now like it's fine they were like what if i don't know i said put that down you're not going to be punished for what you don't know but you're going to be accountable for teaching yourself what you don't know this semester so my whole semester is exposing what they really don't know and then they get a grade for teaching themselves in front of me and in front of each other so okay that, that's, that's just how it is but most of the things that they're talking about i filter it so I'll put like this, even when they say something that could be confusing, I will pause them and say, all right, we need to clear that up because if we don't clear that up right now, this whole thing can derail. Then we'll clear it up and then we can go. And also in my classroom, no one can speak until they have proven that they've listened attentively. So before they Ooh. speak in class, uh, I don't say, so what do you have to say? I always say, what did you hear? And if, mm. they, draw, if they draw a blank, you shoot a blank. <laughs> like you, you and I, you know, my whole class. I tell my class, my class is like a, is like a cookout. You can only eat if you bring something. So if you okay. don't, bring, if you don't bring oh, anything to class, life. straight up. And you know, <laughs> and, and, and trust me, Glow, I got pictures of me in the grill on the grill from undergrad, and I show it to them. And I was like, I'm serious about cookout. Right. You, 
You might want to ask right. Lord Southern, you might want to ask Lord Southern about it. So, but uh, but not nah, I'll put like this: the the positive moments is just seeing all of those students getting challenged to the point where they're no longer comfortable with with repeating the lie, even if they're not comfortable going out there challenging their family members, challenging their closest friends. And I tell them, I said, I can't promise your safety outside my class. But I can promise your safety inside right. my class. So once you go outside your class, you're on your own. Just I need you to know that you're not here to change the world. You need to make sure that the world doesn't change you. And I said, my top priority is not your feelings. It's the babies that didn't choose you as a teacher. They're subjected to That's your right. plan. I said, I only, I said, listen, I, I said, it's too many lives going on around the planet for me to really honestly think we can change everyone. I said, but one thing I will do is make you accountable for how you treat these little children who are defenseless and That's they right. don't have autonomy. That, that is it. I said, when you go to these schools, you're going to play your po political game. You're going to go in the teacher's lounge and do that awkward giggle when you know for a fact that they're, they're tearing these children down. And I said, but after That's you leave right. that teacher's lounge, you better go to little Jamal and let him know, uh, Miss Miss Brunson, you might want to, I need to talk to your mom. You need to change your schedule. <laughs> like, you, you see what I'm saying? I said, you can, you can yeah. work because I tell them this is warfare. You don't just go out in the middle of the battlefield and be like, I'm here. You got to be very strategic about the stuff that you're doing for our children. And like, I make them look at uh, the 13th documentary, right? I make them look at it every year. The and what? some of my students, I'm the 13th documentary for the prison, the school to prison pipeline. Oh yeah. Uh, that was, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm going to be honest with you. When yeah. I made that mandatory, I've literally had students become nauseous in my class to the point where some people got literally And let me tell you, 13 is kind of mild. Yes. It's, it's like yes. 13, I'm, I'm like, yo, baby, it's kind of mild. Yeah. If you really want to get sick to your stomach, I got some books right. for you, baby. You, Color of yes. Law was so difficult for me to read. The new Jim Crow yep. was so difficult for me to read. There's one that I want to yeah. read, but I honestly think I'll never get to it. They were her property. If you really want yeah. to, like, I got some rough, rugged, and raw stuff mm -hmm. for you. And so that's very interesting. Yeah. It's like 13, oh, yeah. you, him up? but I, but I yeah. get it. If you've never been yeah. exposed to it, then. Yeah. It, and, and that's the identity crisis that happened. Because I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of them have been told that nothing went on. So that's too, and I'm going to be honest, and I tell people, <laughs> I put like this, we, we've been lied to, but I ain't going to lie to you. Everybody Ooh. been lied to. Because I'm going to be honest that's with you. Right. And that's, that's one of those things, and I, and I tell people, if anybody is working in diversity and education that's listening to this, please know this. I used to think that people were willfully ignorant for a while until I started having uh, meetings after class and when they're literally bawling out like I didn't know I really didn't know I really and I'm and I one semester I'll be like okay that's a nice try second semester I'm like mm, okay after the you know but I'm talking about year after year and then I'm finding out how much they really don't know I'm going to ask they people don't have to know it. it's they don't time. have to know it and I told them I said now you got to understand, and I tell them this, I said, privilege doesn't mean you have an easy life overall. Privilege means you just don't have to deal with certain things. And what has happened, you're, uh, and, and I tell them raw, I said, a lot of people in the past have structured this whole system, education system, economic system, entertainment system, they've structured to the point where they built a, a space for you where you didn't have to look at the ugly past. And I said, that's not your yeah. fault. However, however, if you don't see it, you will mistreat a child because you've been miseducated about these children. So I that's said, right. I'm not here. For, I'm, right. I said, I'm not here for you to go and argue with your granddad. I'm going to teach you how <laughs> to engage. No, for real. Because I've had some I've had some students be like, I can't wait to go home for Thanksgiving. This is it, Dr. P. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't want you. I, this ain't it. <laughs> I say, I want you to go home, enjoy your turkey. You know, say, do, do what you got to do. But I said, I want you to critically think for the first time. Because I said, arguing 
really doesn't change anything. I said, what well, changes mm -hmm. things when you stop lying to children? And I said, right now, trying to convince adults right now, good luck. I said, what you do have a chance is when you get in front of a child and that child is looking at you because he has been mistreated so much, can you withstand his natural defense mechanism and not take it personally? Can you do that? Can you see that little Jamal or little Marcus doesn't look at you in the face, not because you feel like he doesn't like you. It's because they literally abused them last year. Wow. Can you, can you step out of it? Yeah, can you, down. and I said, can you step out? I said, this teaching, this teaching profession is literally a test for you to step out your ego, period. Can you step out your ego for a moment and notice that if a child doesn't learn from you, it's not because they're slow, it's because there's a disconnection in your classroom and you're the only power, you're the only person powerful enough to reconnect. The children, we, we brought the children here. We're responsible for the environment they're in. So having a child that's disinterested in your curriculum, the child doesn't have a problem. He's not a problem child. There's a problem and the child is responding to it. Mm -hmm. So we have that conversation every semester and I send them out there into the world. And when I'm working with these schools, I see them and they were like, you're here too? And I'm like, yeah, I'm watching everybody. Like, <laughs> I'm watching like, <laughs> y'all. You better not, you, you know what I mean? So, but right. it, it helps them. It helps them to see somebody who's teaching them on campus and that's in the field with them. And they're like, whoa, right. you do practice what you preach. And I'm in there doing mentoring programs with the kids. I'm doing all of this stuff. And they're like, this is serious. I said, this ain't a game. <laughs> like, this ain't a game for real. I've almost got destroyed in schools. People don't understand. I was assaulted by teachers. I was assaulted by, the, uh, by a police officer on the campus of Cedar Grove in front of everybody and nothing happened to them. You know what I'm saying? This stuff is real. And I'm not a victim, but I, I have been targeted. Because if I was a victim, I still wouldn't be here. You know what I mean? So I don't, I don't identify with what happened to me, but I do identify with what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I tell people all the time, man, you are more than what happened to you. You are, and, and back on, not back on it, but just to reemphasize this point, I think when it comes down to race and these labels, I think people are going to have to really have a conversation that admits that you are more than what you look like to somebody else. Mm -hmm. If your label is a description, that means your identity is what somebody else wants you to be, period. Period. And when you're doing, when you're living in the shadow of somebody else's perception, it's easier to lose yourself. You got some, you right. got some many people trying to play a part. They don't even know the role. They don't even right. know the script. And so that's how people end up going kind of ballistic, you know? So when it comes down to diversity, I tell people, like, especially kids in my class, um, defenseless children are your priority. You're going to right. go into certain schools and it's going to be certain things where uh, you go in there and they're going to look at you and like, well, this is how we do things around here or things that are frowned mm -hmm. upon. You got to always ask yourself, if things are frowned upon, whose frown is the most powerful? Because kids are frowning. <laughs> That's right. Not for real. I said kids are frowning every day and nobody gives a damn. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, right. yeah, but that, that's pretty, that was a, that's a positive. The, the teachers that I'm that I'm learning with and I send them out into the field, they already by the time they leave that class. And it's not just my class. They have a whole list of classes they got to take that really give them a hardcore exposure to what real life is before they were born. A lot of them have no idea what history is. They only get a narrative, but they never get history. That's the reason why a lot of them are upset. They only get a story, but they never get the facts. Yeah. yeah. And so, so what, what you're saying now is like really is really resonating with me. And it's like why I wanted to hear one of your positive stories, because I'll tell you what, like, so, you know, I'm sort of a newish mother now. You know what I'm saying? My baby is about two, going to be three in mm -hmm. February. Yeah, and I'll sure. never forget waking up one morning and just thinking it, it. I'll never forget when it hit me that I was having a little black boy. I'll never mm -hmm. forget that because I cried. 
Mm -hmm. I cried for my son who I had not had yet because I understood what that label meant in these United States of America, whether it be, oh, he, in, in, in the idea of like, he was going to grow up and like, what can I do as a mm -hmm. mother for him not to lose his ability to be a child and to have to already, um, kind of take on labels that people were wanted to put on him. Um, whether, you know, it's like, oh, well, he'll be a baby, he'll be cute. And then maybe he'll be, you know, when he's three, he'll be cute. But the question is, when right. does he stop being cute and start being, uh, you know, uh, disrespectful or threatening or suspicious or whatever else? Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. was really hard for me. And so hearing that there is someone that I think is doing work that will better prepare educators <laughs> to go out mm -hmm. and really work with children in a respectful way and to treat them like they're humans and to not mm -hmm. uh, be ruled by their biases about what mm -hmm. they think children are where they're from and and mm -hmm. what their what their ceiling is um mm -hmm. is really helpful to me because i think about you know everybody thinks their kid is the smartest kid you know and so i think isaiah is smart you know what i'm saying but i, I do we have them out um, and he's in a daycare, and but I think about that. I'm like, listen, what you teaching my baby? What's happening? How's he interacting with the other children? Because he is, uh, he's one of two black boys in his class, in his age range, and I'm just like, you know, and I know even when people don't mean to do something, mm -hmm. you're ruled by your worldview. You're gonna sure. respond. Yep. In the way, there's 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 no other way unless you become more aware of it and so i appreciate the um the work you're doing to sure. help people not to abuse the defensive the defenseless children right. that are in their classrooms right. um because i think that's just really important work so it really is thank you for that there's no yeah problem. yeah no um so tell us so um and i because i, I definitely don't want to hold you forever question? you know we can talk forever we talk we there have been times that we just stood and talked for hours at a time. So I know we could do this forever. Tell us, um, tell me, I know that I have, you know, tell us about the comedy thing. Are you doing, what, what's going on with that right now? Like, uh, is, has, is it paused because of the Rona? Or, or are you doing some virtual comp? Like, what's going on, Chris? Where can we see you laugh? Yeah. Is it coming up soon? Or see you tell jokes on it, so it, laugh? It is, it, is, it is on the way. Uh, I would say Corona. I put like this. I had a comedy show in Savannah. The day it shut down on March 13th. And then, it, <laughs> then everything just went down, down, down. Uh. Like, it, but, but I will tell you this. Uh, I've been surrounded by... Uh, other comedians I've been writing. It's a it's a lot of material that's really accumulated <laughs> this year. I would say <laughs> um, uh, I will put like this. Um, I have when it comes down to what I do professionally, I'm I do so many different things that it looks like it's a break where mostly it's just a pause or it's almost like I'm directing traffic now. I'm just letting the I'm letting I'm letting the, the doctorate thing come through right now, and I'm like, hey, comedy, re hold on for that stop sign real quick. Comedy, the light finna turn green though, bro. You be ready, comedy. You know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. So I put like this: Com comedy never stops. I'm if I'm not performing, I'm writing. If I'm not writing, I'm observing. If I'm not observing, I'm just literally just trying to um, get my mind right. Because right now the stage is. Is is really a like a gym. So if you don't want to just go out there and act like you can play in the Super Bowl if you ain't been in the gym all year, right? So what I have right, to do is right. I still got to get my feet wet, got to get down to these open mics, get the rhythm back, uh, do a whole bunch of different things that like feed the comedy world and comedy that comedy muscle. But to answer your question, it'll never die. Comedy is is my lifeline. That's literally how I breathe. You know what I mean? So I got to do it. Right. Like, even, even if I'm not on the stage somewhere, I got to post something funny. I got to say something funny somewhere. You know what I mean? I got to yeah. share, I gotta yeah. share a funny video. Like, I shared that video with that dog that got made a mistake and got high today. That was hilarious to me. It made me feel good. With the woman holding the dog? Yes. Yes. I had, no. I had, I had, I had, project listen, I tear up usually when I, when something's really funny, right? I had projectile tears, like, 
I cried so much, I almost short circuited my like for real. The tears, I felt them touch my laptop, and I had to close my laptop. <laughs> like I was like, man, I'm finna short circuit, but but it's so it's so needed to laugh, and that's the reason why comedy is. I even had to write it put like this. When I wasn't performing comedy, I put comedy in my dissertation. I was writing about right. Paul. Yeah, I was exactly. writing about I was writing about Paul Mooney. I was writing about Richard Pryor. Dick Gregory is all and Chris Rock, they're all and Dave Chappelle, all of them are all in my dissertation because I, I literally study them. And honestly, the funny part is is uh Paul Mooney really got me researching more than anybody I was reading. I get a mm. lot of my history from comedians. Dave Chappelle is a historian. Paul Mooney, mm -hmm. historian. Richard Pryor, mm -hmm. historian. Red Fox, historian. They just made history funny to me. And I'm going to be honest with you, they're like professors to me. When they got up there, that's literally what they were doing. They were teaching their crowds. And that's right. what I got from them. So when it comes down to comedy, uh, Big Chris will never leave it. They're going to have to carry me off the stage. And you, if you're going to carry me somewhere, you got to use your legs. Don't use your back. So, so you know what I mean? So it's 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 always going to be there. But thank you for asking for that. I plan on doing some things over the Christmas break uh, as soon as I – because the open mic and the COVID thing is a little different. So uh, I am going to start doing some things online uh, when I start doing some more consulting with parents and, and, and kids and things of that nature. And comedy is always a part of what I do. I will slip a joke in anything that I'm doing. So comedy is not just on the stage. Comedy is literally a way of life. So I can't leave it. And where and I'm put it like this: what mentally, where I'm at now is no matter where I am, that's gonna be my stage. That's what's up. Cool, 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 cool. Appreciate it. So let's do this. I, I'm gonna wrap us up. Tell us okay. where. Tell everyone where they can follow you on Instagram. Like so, shoot us out mm -hmm. your social stuff right now, so folks can follow the work that you're doing. Cause I think I believe that you are doing the Lord's work. I just want to let you know since we talking, <laughs> I believe the Lord's work is being done through what you're doing. I'm serious. So let's uh, let's shoot out your social so that we can uh, have folks following you. Gotcha. So people can follow me on Instagram uh, under Manhood Mindset, uh, one word. Uh, on Twitter, Manhood Mindset, and I'm on Facebook, uh, just under Christopher Pugh. Uh, they can go directly to my website for people who want some consultations. So I've noticed that a lot of parents and students now, their their schedule is getting a little bit better now uh, that is later mm -hmm. in the semester. So I have a lot of parents and professionals signing up for mentoring and uh, cons consultation sessions uh, through manhoodmindset.com. So there's a link on there when you scroll all the way down to the bottom and said set up a consultation just sign up put all your information and i will email you or give you a call and then we can set up a zoom conversation with you your student uh either your your spouse because i do romantic relationship consulting as well anybody with a heartbeat really? okay. oh yeah 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 because any like i feel I like this a lot of times when when it, I, I do anything that affects a child's life so uh, the parents' romantic relationship, if they're not on the same page, it will cause anxiety to the child. So sometimes I end up talking to parents about, do y'all still like each other? Like, do you, do you, do you, when you see her? Because that's important. It's important. That's an important first question because people, I think people confuse love and like a whole lot. You can love someone and don't like them. Right. It, it is, and it, I, the, to be able to find someone who both loves you and likes you, right? That's why you you hit gold right there. If I right. love you and I like you, so right. you just that's a good first question. Do you and even I, do you like? And I tell you this, I say, look, sometimes hard times erase the love and the like. I said, my non-negotiable is respect. Do you respect her, or do mm. you respect him? Because what happens is. The love and the light, those are the emotions. They come and go. They're like the, the wind or the waves in the ocean, right? They up one day, down the next. But respect is the ocean floor. It is standard. That's where everything else happens because nothing, nothing can take place without standing on respect at the end of the day. And children know when their parents have lost respect for each other. That's when this child starts losing respect for the parents and then when they go out to the world, they don't respect themselves. 
so I, yep. so it yep. got to the point it got to the point where I had to consult re romantic relationships because those romantic relationships were affecting the child even um, mm. single parents the spouses that they either have not forgiven or they're still hanging on to and they're taking it out on the children I had to say no we need to fix that I don't care if y'all together but your attitude towards the other parent is destroying the kid. That's the reason why he doesn't do his work because you're always bad mouthing his mother or vice versa. The reason why he's not doing his work is because you're telling him he's just like his father and you say horrible things about his father. So children draw conclusions that people don't see. Most of the conclusions that children draw are mental and they take them around with them all day, every day. So a lot of kids don't understand where, oh, you really didn't mean it. Kids think you mean everything. Everything. So, yeah, so I consult anybody with a heartbeat, people looking for careers, because if parents are frustrated with their career choice, they literally take it out on the kid. <laughs> so everything I do has the child's best interest. Um, grandparents, aunts and uncles, I don't care who it is. Principals. It gets to the point now where the principal and the parent got into it, and I've had to have the principal and the parent on the call at the same time. Straight up. Good Lord. It gets that deep. We, we ain't playing no games because if the child does not control their body, they're literally <laughs> getting on a school bus and being mandatory to go somewhere every day is the most acceptable form of human trafficking. <laughs> so they have to go. <laughs> they can't control where they go. They really can't. So no they can't choice. It ain't no choice. So if you have to deal with the, these adults, these adults are going to have to know what they're saying and how it's affecting these kids. So, yeah. So just uh, anybody who wants to sign up for a consultation or mentorship or if you just need someone to listen, I am a very good listener. We can listen all day and I get you one or two sentences and it'll change your life. That's what somebody told me. So, <laughs> so we'll go it's there. True. It's true. Hey. I, I can vouch for the fact that you will be confused and frustrated. And you would be like, Chris, yo, what in the world? And he will say, bat, 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 bat. And you'll be like, what? what? And it'll get you right. It'll get you right for a little bit. I can vouch for that. I can vouch hey. for that. Um, hey, you call, matter listen, of fact, you call, listen, I remember one said, day. I remember you called me to, you said no. one day, and I, I was going to put this on the T-shirt. I'm going to still do it. you like, you know what? You're a habitual jewel dropper. I said, you know what? That's it. You know, Oh, remember that? Jewel dropper. Yes. It's a habit. I said, you know He's what, Glow? I said, yeah. I said, I'm going to give you credit, Glow. And now it's on it's hey, on look. record. Look, Glow said it I'll first. I'll take that credit. I'll take that credit. Yes, Just Glow give me about 5% on the shirts. Uh, I and got on the you. merchandise. That's what I up. got you. I got you. I got you. Yeah. I got you. Thank you. Thank you for this, though. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, no, thank you. I, um, mm. I, you know, we always have really great conversations, and yeah. I know you always have really good things to say. And I thought that I feel like I need to expose Chris's mind to other people. And so I've been <laughs> doing these live streams, and maybe someone will listen. Maybe they'll watch it during yeah. the the live, or maybe they'll watch it in replay. So this has been really dope. Thank mm. you. You're like my. So this is funny. You're my first official like thing. like a football coach but that was losing the halftime at the homecoming game. He was like, hey! Lord have I <laughs> He was talking to them all kind of way. I was like, wait, I, I gotta say something about that. So I, I, think, I don't know if I can wait until after the runoff for that. We might have to hop on that next week. Yeah, we might no, have to no, no. hop on that. Let me see. I'm going on vacation starting I'm gonna be honest. at 5 o'clock. I might have to hop on. I'm, I'm going to be honest I, with you, Glow. You have to talk though. about it because the things he's doing right now is affecting the runoff. 
That's what I'm looking at. The things that he's doing is affecting him. Like, hold on, man, what you doing? <laughs> like, and I'm like, dude, just stop. Just don't do nothing until after the run. <laughs> like, I don't think he knows because he's in a bubble. I don't, I don't think he knows because he's in a bubble. You know, oh, for, man. For real, for real. Oh, man. He, he and has oh, women man. protecting him right now, so he can't he can't tell how he might be impacting himself. And somebody is in here. If Ivory's still here, Ivory, when all of this is over, girl, you know we got to hop on one to talk about your work in the political space as an organizer doing all this good work. I think people need to hear from somebody who is on the grind. So we yeah. got to get you in here at some point. Just yeah. say yes. Don't say no. She but uh, all right. Look, listen, this has been good. I could keep yeah. ripping all night. I know, Thank man. you so we much. Do, let's do a part we, two in the, we, in the we future. Gotta do this. We got to pick another topic and do it again sometime. Yeah, Chris. we got to. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm flexible. It don't matter. It don't matter what it is. Just let me know. That's what's up. That's what's up. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you for everyone who tuned in tonight. And I will definitely catch you later. Good night, Chris. Hey. Good night, thank everybody. You. Send me a cash up. DM me. <laughs> I just play. Bye. <laughs> Peace. Bye. Peace.